And if you can hit record for me, thank you. So hi everyone, as you all know, I'm Shirley Hernandez. I'm a work-based learning coordinator here for MDUSD. And today we have our final guest speaker, uh, Chef K, and all the students and the staff and teachers are all excited to hear from you. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Got it. Uh, hey, Chef Cindy, how many kids are there? There must be 80, is there 80 now? 70, well, there's about 60. Eight students in the class right now. Awesome. All right. Well, nice to meet you guys. Uh, and then there's four or five teachers that are here. Got it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show you. Uh, so instead of me just talking about myself, which you know every chef likes that. Um, it's one of the enough about me. What do you think about me? Kind of thing. Um, I'm hoping to you know give you a couple of fun jokes, a uh, little bit of life lesson. Um, maybe a couple of tools um, in kind of how to approach a problem um, that I've learned in in, uh, in, in the industry. Uh, let me share. You'd also like to know where you came from and where you've worked too. All Got that it. stuff. Can everybody see my presentation? Yes. Great. Okay. So this is me. Um, I've uh, I've so you know all of us. You know, I, then, let me take a big step back, right? So I was on track. I was, I took the MCAT. I went to grad school. Um, you know, first time I went to grad school was for environmental toxicology. Let me close my door. And um, I literally walked out of my graduate degree. Like one day I decided I had enough, I'm going to leave. And if you can't tell, I'm Chinese. Uh, my Chinese mother, Chinese immigrant mother, did not speak to me for a whole year, right? So mm -hmm. to prove her wrong, I kept, I kept cooking and I got pretty good at it. Um, but so, you know, if, if, don't, if, if you're gonna burn bridges, you gotta make sure that you're right. Or if not, you know, if you're not sure that if you're right, at least die trying. So I was definitely in that die trying kind of uh, mentality. Um, I've done a few things since then. I went to, went to culinary school at CIA. Um, is it the best culinary school? They would like to tell you. They definitely charge the most. Um, it is really what you put in. You know, the more you put in, the more you get out, right? So when I get a student, I always ask when a student comes for, for externship, how school? There's two kinds of answer. Those that answers school is amazing. And then there are the other kinds that says school sucks. 99% of the time, the people that say school sucks, they're not paying for their culinary education. Their parents are. Right, it's it's a trade school for them that they're just doing because their their parents tell them that after they graduate high school they got to do something other than, you know, just go into industry for us and they should go get a go get a skill or something. For those that actually said school's great, they recognize the fact that school is four hundred dollars a day and they're going to get their four hundred dollars worth of information, and they're not afraid to take that mentality and ask the chefs and push the chefs to teach them more, push your friends. And if they can't get it, they create a group so that they can, you know, you can they can actually share with each other and their past life experience. So, you know, guess what? Guess guess which kid I'm going to hire, right, for for my externship. And if you take that mentality in mind, you know, that kind of you know going growing up in a career, you're not going to have any issue with that. Um, so after after culinary school, cooked around, worked for Marcus Samuelson, Aquavi. Um, left and then you know I became a department uh, uh, director of purchasing because I will learn learn the buying side of things and the business side of things. I did that for a year and then I was at French Laundry for five years working for Thomas Keller. I finished as a sous chef for him and then this beautiful gentleman over here, Hein Chef Morimoto, um, was opening up a restaurant in Napa. I, I was able to we're fortunate that you know to know somebody that end we I end up taking over the exec chef role and there for three years. This photo is actually from the, the Iron Chef battle I was on with Chef Morimoto. It was the holiday wild boar tailgate battle, right? And our our um, opponent was Michael Simon and his sous chef. Let me ask you this, right? When do you think tailgate? Do you think two guys from Cleveland? That goes the Big Ten or two Asian guys, not from this country, when it comes to like tailgate party, right? Chef wanted to grill a fish. We lost the battle, but I think this was in the pro in the process of losing that battle here. But it was quite an experience. Um, 
these couple other photos, that was me as a, as a student. This is me with Chef Thomas. And then this was me at Tyson Foods when I was developing one of the, the weird, um, uh, weird cut, um, patented cuts that I created. Um, slide. Okay, so the, the, the quick lesson, quick and dirty lessons, and this is kind of a, the top topic for the past few years in, in terms of product development. So my last six years, my last six of my last seven years was spent at Tyson Foods. And the remaining uh, couple of years there, I was with a group called the um, Innovation Lab. And our job was really to come up with disrupt, very, very disruptive products that nobody's seen of or heard of. And this was the tool which we use. So all of you who are interested in, in product development someday, who want to go to R&D, design thinking is, is where it's at for the moment at least. They may come up with some new, new tool at some point and down the road, but this is, this is what's it. And so I'm gonna walk you through a, a pretty you know, fast, fast you know, short version of this. So there's a YouTube videos. Um, I'm not gonna play this, but you're welcome to, to uh, look it up. But it talks about the design firm EDO in the Bay Area designing a shopping cart um, and how they came up with it. And this was done in 1997. Um, but the process which they used to get to that cart was these few steps, emphasize, define, IDA prototype and test, right? Emphasize is really the idea of like, what is the consumer's problem? And this is always related back to the user or the consumer. What's the, pro what's the real problem? Most of the time when we, when we design a product, it is designed for the business. It's, you know, our, our business is meat cutting. So we're gonna design a product because we cut meat. Whereas this is really looking about what does, what does, the, what does the customer need? What does a user need? Like, and if you know those needs, and maybe some of those needs could be fulfilled by our, by our business. You got to define that problem. And then IDA is, you know, a lot of step, a lot of post-its, a lot of ideas. You diverge, you converge, you diverge and converge, meaning that, you know, you think big picture and then you think very granular and then you go back and forth to really get that down to the product that you can use. Then, and then you go and you prototype and you make these things, right? It doesn't have to be pretty. It just needs to show the idea. And then you test it with a customer in a way, you test it with a consumer in a way that doesn't, that doesn't break the bank. Before this was created, imagine a large company like IBM. They'll go and spend years and years and years defining the problem and designing the product. And by the time they get it to the field, you know, it might be outdated. It might be not useful, right? It's not what the customer need because that's what the engineer thought the customer need, but the customer doesn't really need that. So you should look this up. It's a pretty interesting um, process. And, you know, this could be used in your daily life as well as product development. So what does everybody see here in terms, like when we see computers and we see people, does anybody see a sort of a common theme? besides a computer and people working. Put it in the chat, guys. Anybody? Oh, there's one. Color scheme, laptop. Laptop, color scheme, not holding the laptop right. Great, Mario. What else you got? Mario, keep be working on that holding run, yeah. Right. So let me, let, so the, this is there. And if I tell you that what is wrong with laptop, and if I pose the question, what is wrong with laptops? And what is the wrong with the way we work, right? So if you look at it, the, 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 the unifying theme here is that most of us, when we have our laptop and we want to show somebody something that we have on the laptop next door, we literally have the laptop open and we put a finger in it so that you don't close and add an accidentally close off of your program and then requiring okay. you know, a minute and a half boot up to show somebody something, right? Imagine you, you have, you know, your boss is busy. Your boss has got 
about 20 seconds for you to pitch him an idea and it's on the laptop and you're running your laptop over and the worst thing can happen is that you close your laptop and the program that you're running takes like 10 seconds to boot it back up and, and your boss is like losing interest, right? So from this idea, there are a lot of things like this in the world where if you observe hard enough and you really think about like, why are they doing it that way? You can come up with some really amazing insights. Um, so one of our first projects using this process was food waste, right? And this is near and dear to all of us. You know, we throw a lot of food out because food is cheap. Food is cheap because government subsidized food heavily. And so that, you know, your labor price has gone up a great deal, but the food price has really gone up. So we're making cheaper and cheaper food from a manufacturing perspective. And if you're making cheap food, you're not really growing food or making food with the, the right nutrition, the right, the right amount of care, and therefore it exacerbates that, that circle, right? So therefore we throw so much food out because the value is so low. What if you grow your own vegetables and you raise your own animal? Would you, would you be so careless in throwing the tops out of the carrots? Would you be so careless in throwing the shred out on, you know, the skin on the carrots out? Would you, you know, take the pig feed and throw that in the trash can because you don't like pig's feed? You'll find uses for it, right? And as we become, you know, richer and richer nations, we delegate those off cuts, we delegate those, you know, things that we don't want to other countries that still, you know, that still treasure those things. So when it comes to waste, you know, who's waste? Is it consumers? Is it industry waste? And why are these, you know, bananas in here when they're perfectly good for banana bread, right? So from a grocery st standpoint, they're throwing this out because they don't want to spend the labor to really sort through it. And, you know, I always joke with, with my grocery friend, you know, who runs groceries, like, you know, I can never find a banana to bake banana bread because in order for me the banana bread, I have to buy a bunch of bananas and make sure that the kids don't know the bananas there and wait for the banana to go black so that I can make the banana bread, right? So why don't you merchandise it in a way so you can have banana ready to eat in three days, banana ready to eat today, and banana, you know, that's good for banana bread so that all of it gets the right value and that they get used for the right thing. So these are the steps that we use in defining this waste. And for our first product, we were, we defined that there's a lot of chicken trim. There were a lot of, um, a lot of uh, spent grain from brewing beer. And then when, when everybody, we used to have be on this, you know, juice kick, everybody liked these raw juice, juice kicks, like all the pulp is landfilled, even though all the pulp is where the fiber is, where the nutrient is. So how do you take those wastes and make, actually make it into a product? So we, we made it into this thing called uh, Yapa Chicken Crisp. Um, this use, there's two of the SKU uses the spent grain from the brewing process. And then the other three uses the pulp from the juicing business that they juice carrots, they juice celery. Um, and we, we use those pulp and we build it into this chip. Um, the other thing too is that these chips are made from the same machines that make cereal. Um, and the cereal machines, you know, our diet has changed and we don't eat cereal like we did 20 years ago. So a lot of those cereal machines are actually sitting idle. So we end up being able to repurpose a few of those cereal machines to use it to make this chip. And we made it into Time Magazine's top 10 smartest sustainable product 2018. So um, that was pretty cool for a little team of, uh, of six at Tyson Foods, right? Tyson's not known for being, you know, good on food waste and we were able to kind of really disrupt that, um, disrupt that, um, that field. And the next project we worked on was, was a meat project. And these are the things that I've been trying to show Chef, uh, Chef Cindy. Um, the meat business is a really interesting business. Prior to 1990, all of the muscle on the, on the beef carcass was pure profit, right? That's a, so what does that mean? That means that once you slaughter a cow, you, the, the actual cost of that cow and the cost of slaughtering, it's paid for by everything that came off that's not the muscle. So all the muscle on the, on the cow carcass, it was just cash for them. So, and the, 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 the things that was being sold to pay for the cow at that point was leather, 
um, pancreas, and then um, bones. So leather went to the tanning industry, okay? So like it goes to leather shoes. How many of you are actually wearing leather shoes, right? Nobody wear leather shoes these days. Everybody wear cloth shoes, you know, nylons and all that. It's anything but leather. So that industry kind of really dwindled. The pancreas was used for bovine insulin. So there's, a, there's the reason that that's not being used is that there is a small percentage of people in the United States who are allergic to, to insulin. So whatever the drug company was paying the uh, beef industry to, for those, you know, pancreas no longer, this is no longer there because they switched to lab grown, you know, lab, lab made insulin. And the last thing is bones. Bones was used for film emulsion for Kodak film. So Kodak Eastman, you know, for all of you that, that don't know, they used to own the film processing, the film, the, you know, the photography business. They own every part of that business. So nobody knows that they, they've gone out of business, right? So that those three industries used to pay very good money for all the pieces of cows that that people don't want to eat. So they found out find value in it. After 1990s, the beef industry recognized the fact that they're no longer making enough money off the processing of each of the the, the, the beef carcass. So they win and they start cutting beef in a way, cutting up the animal in a way. So then now you have a lot of new cuts, right? So, you know, um, Denver steak, flat iron, those are all created at that same time. They're looking for value off the carcass. The analogy I like to use is like stealing a car, right? So you steal a car if the police is there and you got to sell the car really fast. You don't make much money out of that transaction, that sale. But if you have the labor and you have somebody who wants to buy it, you can literally take that car and break it down in a chop shop into you know wheels and steering wheels and the nuts and bolts and you can get you can good, get good money for each one of those components you make more money overall so that that's why the the beef industry has undergone that change however the the, the pork industry has never really made that transition the pork industry is sort of suffering from you know the chicken industry taking over the uh, the other white meat um, um, we, we eat more chicken now than we do pork, whereas pork used to be, you know, the most consumed protein. Um, so these are some of the things I just talked about, right? So there's, you know, the cost of processing a hog, it, you know, labor's gone up, you know, hogs are getting bigger and bigger because the more labor you have, the animal, you want the animal to be bigger because the amount of labor that it takes to process a 200 pound pig is the same as a 300 pound pig. But on a 300 pound pig, you know, that labor is, is, you know, amortized over, you know, the course of 300 pound worth of pig. So these are some of the challenges that the industry is facing. So we're trying to figure out how do you create more value off of a, off of pork carcass, you know, the same kind of work that the beef, beef industry has done. How do you create demand? You know, some of the things that we thought about is, well, in general, we just eat less meat and we eat smaller portion of meat. So whatever the industry is producing right now is not the right size. Um, there are a bunch of weird, you know, pieces of meat on pork as well that generally doesn't make it to your supermarket shelf because nobody knows what to do with them or it requires a lot of labor and they just, you know, they don't have the time to deal with. Um, let's see. Um, and then we have to, you know, we have to create more premium cut things that people actually want to pay money for, right? So, you know, um, I love menudo. So I love menudo, but I hate processing and cleaning intestines, right? So how do you make it all into something that's menudo ready that people will like for their menudo versus just handing them the raw unclean intestines? So those are some of the considerations we had. Um, the first the first piece we looked at was, you know, this is a, a bone-in um, rack of pork. Um, the reason that it looks like this is because they actually take out the cap and with the pork belly and send it to Japan. But you see these little piece, pieces of meat that looks like uh, that looks like a little washboard. Those are the meat. Those are the rib meat in between bones. So that they're called the inter intercostal muscles. Those are the bone. Those are the meat that you eat between the bone when you get a rack of ribs. Right now, they're actually taking they taking a knife, they're cutting those off, and they're grinding it. And first thing I said is like, why are you grinding that? Right? That's that that like is the most dis delicious part of the rib. So I had them fillet that off, and I took two pieces together, 
seasoned it and put that in a crowd back and cooked it. And what you get is this thing on the right. It is like the true McRib and it's not a, you know, not a weird McRib from McDonald's. That's actually a true McRib using what potentially was ground pork, which is what, like 80 cents a pound. Once you make it into a McRib, this is, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight dollars a pound. So that was the first, um, first patent we filed. The second patent we filed was taking the spare rib and making into a rib lollipop. So we spare rib is sort of the cheaper of the of, of the the two ribs, right? There's a back rib and there's a spare rib. Oh. And the St. St. Louis rib is made from taking the spare ribs and cutting off the flank portion of it to make it look like a back rib. So we took this whole piece without trimming off any meat and basically cleaned it, cleaned the bone up, wrapped it up, tied it, roasted it, or smoked it. And what you get was very center of the plate rib eating experience that's good for a white tablecloth barbecue joint. And the last piece we made was taking a bone in rack of the bone in loin and then made a petite rack and a porchetta from it. And the reason that we made a petite, petite rack is that, you know, if you go out to the grocery store and you're trying to buy a pork chop, and the pork chop is this big, right? It's, it's a big piece and it's very thin. It's very thin because they're trying to keep it under a pound. You know, it's a 12, eight, 10 ounce pork chop or 12 ounce pork chop. And the only way they can cut a 12 ounce pork chop is cut it thin enough. Well, when you cut meat that thin, he overcooks in an instant and he dries out in an instant. But what it looked like if it can give you a 12 ounce pork that has two bones and that actually looks like, you know, a lamb chop or a veal chop. And like, sure, we can do that. Well, what do you do with all the trip? Well, we made a porchetta out of it. So currently porchetta is made from taking, you know, either a whole pig, bone it out, roll it up, or you can take a pork belly. Oh, my mom called me. She you can take a pork belly and roll it up. And roast it. So we took the trim off this, this wrap, this uh, loin, and then basically filleted it out to make it into a porchetta. So what was, you know, loin, loin, I think, bone in loin, I think is $1.20 a pound. And we made, you know, the petite rack, which was like $7 a pound and the porchetta $6 a pound. So the total value of this two piece is much more than this loin by itself. And this was the finished dish made, this is the finished dish we have from this, uh, this rack. Um, oh, and what does it look like if you do it to a prime rib? So this is a bone in prime rib. Um, we, we made a, a petite prime rib, a petite a tomahawk, and then a petite prime rib, which is taking the cap off and then rolling it. So now that you have a plate size roast versus, you know, something that's so big, it's hard to handle. Um, so the, the, these were patent approved and they made it into a magazine. Um, this is the second to the last slide. Can you guys, you guys know what this guy is signing the book? I see somebody grinning, so you guys must know. So you see this guy standing right there with two books in his hand? I can tell you exactly what he's thinking of. He has just been handed a second book by a girl who had just dumped him. And he's really bitter that he has to be nice to her so that he, and since she asked him to get her book signed as well. That girl became my wife and that's me. And there's me uh, second in line because this guy was a TA and he completely butted into, into the line. I remember this exactly, to get my book signed by Thomas Keller. The communication director for French Laundry found this when I was a sous chef, and this was, oh, uh, 10 years later. Uh, 10, yeah, eight or 10 years after the fact. And she wrote to me, chef, is that you? And I was like, yes. So I, I took this picture and I forwarded to Thomas Keller. And I was like, look, chef, dreams do come true. And Thomas, one sentence re replied back to me, he says, I think you were 30 pounds lighter. That was this one sentence back and I was giggling the whole time, right? And then I wrote back to him, chef, and you didn't have any gray hair in your hair, right? So anyways, so dreams do come true, right? So if you guys set your mind to something, you wanna do it, you always get back to it. Um, and then my last slide is some of the takeaway, right? So I have to qualify this. This is not a very nice way to say, it, but think like a fat guy. The fat guy is the most efficient guy ever. You think about it, doing a halftime at a game, that guy is gonna get up, get his drink, go to the bathroom, walk the dog, you know, and get his sandwich. And he's, he's not gonna make five trips. He's gonna make one trip because he's smart, he's efficient. 
right? I'm not saying cut corners. I'm saying think about what you're doing and be efficient about it. This is a joke. This comes from the joke of two guys hiking up in the woods and then one of them walks in between a bear and the cub. Then the mom, mama bear starts chasing them and both of them are running down the, the running down the path. And all of a sudden, one of the kid, one of the guys sits down and starts putting on his running shoes. And his buddy running down the trail says, what are you doing putting on your running shoes? You can't run, outrun a bear. And the guy says, I don't have to outrun a bear. I just need to outrun you, right? So you don't have to be the best in the kitchen. You just have to be better than the guy next to you. That's all, that's all you need. And once you're better than the guy next to you, find somebody else that you want to be better than. And just that's, that's all you need. Little steps, little steps. And before you know it, you're, you're doing tons better, right? You're just that much better than everybody else in the, in the kitchen. Next one, work for a boss who works harder than you do, right? Don't find a schmuck of a, of a boss who like doesn't do much and sits on the computer who gets you to do everything. Find somebody who works harder than you do. Your resume will grow because of that, right? If, they, if they're adding value to their business, you are part of that business. You know, if the restaurant you work in today becomes Michelin stars in, in three years, how, how much is your resume worth? The other, now I'll look at it the other way. If the restaurant you're working in today closed in three years, who cares? What have you done, right? So work for somebody who works harder than you do. And then last thing, just because you're the best in your industry doesn't mean that your industry is outdated, right? Food industry is a tough one and we all need to eat. However, the way that you go about working in this industry is important, right? So be smart about how you position your career and how you position yourself and be at the le leading edge of the industry, whatever industry it, it's in, rather than on the dying edge of it. So I think that's my last slide and I'll stop talking about it and then you know be happy to answer any questions you all might have. Students or staff, you can put um, your questions in the chat box and I'll read them out loud before Chef K. Let's see. I know it's up here somewhere. I'll start. Um, what inspired you to become a chef? Sorry, what was that? What, is, what or who inspired you to become a chef or work in this field? Um, I know I'm supposed to have some like grandiose answer, but we've always made things from scratch at home. Um, and I was pretty frustrated at grad school, no matter how hard I studied. I just couldn't get ahead. Like it was insane. It was impossible. I didn't have the discipline, and I really didn't have the. I didn't have the discipline. I didn't have the 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 understanding to be where I was at the time. And cooking seemed like the most interesting for me at that time because my family has always cooked, right? Um, so it's nothing glorious. It's really it's we was born out born out of frustration. Um, so, but you know. Got it. How long have you been doing this? Uh, 15 years? No, yeah, no, 20, oh my God, 22 years now. I feel old. <laughs> what is the usual pay rate for a chef? Pay rate for a chef? Uh, I made $30,000 a year at 30 years old. I was a French laundry. I made $45,000 at 35 years old. I was leaving French Laundry. I made 65 at Morimoto when I first walked in at 36 years old, 35, 36 years old. I left Morimoto making 95 when I was 38. At Tyson, I was making 105 and I was 40 by then, I think. Um, and it only goes up from there. I, however, I'm going to have to put it to you. Like if you chase money, you will never, never, never learn. Right. How much, let me, let me, let me ask this another way. How much do you think the, how much do you think the, um, how much do you think the secret service gets paid jumping in front of the president when, when the assassin comes? Right. I used to ask this questions and my staff would be like 250, a thousand a year. $500,000 a year, $750,000 a year. 
if you get paid $750,000 a year, you won't jump in front of a president when the time comes, right? So do it for the reason that you know, like do it for a reason and money really can't be that reason. If you do it right, if you do the right for the right reason, money will follow. Um, and at the end of the day, it's like making more money doesn't mean you're richer. It just means you have more money to spend, right? So do make money, also be smart about it and, you know, don't just work for money. Thank you. Um, both chefs want to know if you can talk a little bit about um, Showbiotics Culinary. Yeah, so we are in a room of engineers who loves food but don't know food. So I'm here really to push the to push the food side of this company as far as we can, meaning that you know the engineer has an idea they think they want to do it's it's like um, it's, a, it's like somebody who's never cooked wanting to make, you know, Thanksgiving meal. They're like, okay, they kind of know the process. They need a turkey, they need this and that, until they really get to it. It'd be like, oh, I got to go find a turkey. It's what kind of turkey should it be? Should it be air, heirloom? Should it be, you know, air chill? Should it be, you know, water chill? Like, what do I want to put it? So they have an idea, like they have the, the concept of what they want to do, but they never really ex expanded it. So my, my role here is really expand the, the library of the ingredients that we can dispense from Sally, um, expand on the recipes, expand on the menus, and then also push on hardware, right? So there's a bunch of things that we wanna dispense that the engineers never really designed for, like dispensing long noodles, dispensing avocados that only, you know, only a chef who, who lives it, you know, day in and day out can kind of Kind of recommend and then have them, you know, develop towards. Um, where did you go to college, and what are some career opportunities and potential in this area? Uh, I went to undergrad University of California in Riverside. I went to grad school the first time, grad school, University of Cincinnati. I went to CIA after that, uh, a while after that, and then my master's degree is from uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. What is the job market for food scientists, R&D chefs? Is there a high need? Uh, what is the job market for food scientists? Um, what else? And R&D chefs. R&D chefs, right. Um, there are definitely more opportunities out there when it comes to food scientists, R&D chefs. Um, the don't, I would say don't worry about your career starting thinking that that's exactly what you want to do because a well-rounded chef is more useful in R&D than somebody who's really good at one thing. So at this stage in your life and for the next few years, like put yourself in as many hairy situations as possible. And let me kind of qualify that. When I say hairy situation, it means that every day you're barely holding on because if you don't push now, you're never going to push. And you definitely don't want to push when you're 55 and your knees are blowing out. So right now you need to get as much exposure as you can and put yourself in as diverse a situation, diverse restaurant, diverse environment as you can before you make a decision on how you want to take your career. Um, Chef Cindy is asking if you can show a picture of Sally. Uh, yeah, I think I can. Too many screens open. You want to ask me another question as well? I pull a... One of the students wants to know what your favorite dish to make is. Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, I will make everything at least once. Um, I'm a huge fan of tacos and I can't, I, don't, I think part of it is I, be, I just can't make very good tacos no matter how hard I try. Um, so I keep making it. Um, the kids don't complain, but um, I love to butcher. It, it's always been um, a, a big hobby of mine and I love, you know, I can butcher all day and be quite, be quite happy. Uh, let's see, share the screen. Hey, Chef, you could come when it's open to campus and we'll make you street tacos here in the classroom. My kids will knock it out of the water for you. Oh my God, I would love it if I can work, make, make it with them. So here's Sally. Can you see my, uh, I, didn't, I didn't hit share. It doesn't work when I don't hit share. So here's the actual machine. Um, the bottom is really just a, 
uh, a, a, a shelf and then, you know, it's a refrigerated unit. It's got 22 canisters inside. Oh, look. So we got poke, we got poke bowl on here. We got you know, hummus bowls on here. We got, this is all updated. It was actually really nice. I haven't, I haven't been to this website in a while. Um, the, the, so the, you, you and I talked about you bringing a Sally out here and yep. for a day and letting the kids put things in it and experimenting and working with us. Yes. We would love to take you up on that when we can get back into class. All right. It's still on the table um, for sure. The, the, the thing about Sally is that does, any, does everybody know Peloton? Probably what Peloton is, right? Yeah. Peloton is really a tablet on top of an exercise bike, right? But the moment that you put a tablet on top of an exercise bike, all of a sudden the doors to the world opens. Now you can have classes online, you can have classes, you can work, you know, exercise with other people. So imagine what it looks like if you could put a restaurant online and you have all that data that you can't have when running a real restaurant. In order for you to have this much data in a real restaurant, you have to physically generate those data points, right? You take temperature of the food, you write down how much usage you've had, you have an inventory, how much product you bought, how much money you made. All that is like, it, it's done by hand at the current level. With Sally, everything is online. Everything is collected, right? And that's the power of it. So in, imagine having 30 Sally's, you know exactly how much food is in each one of them. You know exactly how much sales you've made. You know how much, uh, when you need to go service it and then, you know, what prep you need to make for each one of the Sally. And then you make a prep sheet, make a, you know, make a prep sheet, have the kitchen prep it, you make a distribution list, have the driver, you know, drive, you know, drive the deliver a certain number of canisters for each of the machines. So to, to me, it is the future. Um, to me, what does it look like if you see a Sally at every corner, right? You see a Sally at the gym which currently costs too much to, uh, the, the reason that gym doesn't have a restaurant operation is that the cost to get certifications and get food safe and in, in, you know, install a kitchen, it's just, it's prohibitive. And then the amount of money you make for people going to the gym is really not worth the, it's not worth the, the installation. But what does it look like if you roll Sally in? It's a much easier process, it's a much cheap buy-in. So to me, it, that, that's why I'm here. Um, you know, I think we've got a lot of runway in that especially during COVID, you know, it's, that's all, it's not an open food bar. It's a lot, lot fewer touches. What are you most passionate about in culinary and what makes you most happy? Um, ooh. I love to eat. If that's not, not that's not obvious. Um, I love to feed, you know, um, I think that the thing about culinary is I just when I think I know quite a bit and I realize I really don't know anything and you know no matter you you no, no matter what area that you dive into there's the world to, to behold right and you can you can like super nerd out on like as many parts of culinary as you want and then still have a lot more to to, to go um yeah so I, I think that's why I, I really like it and I think you know the other thing is like when I was in the and my first, my first um, master's degree that I walked out on was, I was, you know, exposing mice, pregnant mice to chromium and then trying to figure out if the chromium is teratogenic or mutagenic. So I was killing mice, you know, extracting the, the liver. Hey, it's fine, but like, you can't eat it, right? Or it's like food, like at the end of the day, I can eat what I made. It's I, I'm never bored, right? It, it's just, I don't know. I, that's probably the biggest thing. What are you most proud of? Um, that make my kids like food and that they enjoy food. Um, and they're not afraid to ask, um, ask for us to make things, right? They're, at the end of the day, like, you know, it's, it's, they're engaged in the growing, the, you know, the prepping and then the, the eating of the food. And I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, they, they recognize that, you know, it's a good hobby and we, we should eat well, right? If you can eat well, we should eat well. And so. Um, does your work allow you to travel? Um, lately, no. And travel might seem like a really cool thing to do until 
it is Christmas Eve and you can't get home because the airports are closed because there's a storm in O'Hare. Um, when you're younger, it's fun and you get to see quite a bit. Um, I've been to quite a few places with chefs. Um, and I, I always joke that when I was working in a restaurant, you know, between Thomas Keller and Morimoto, I got to go to, I got to go to the Olympics. I got to go to um, Hong Kong. I got to go to South, you know, um, South Beach in Florida. And then when I went to Tyson Foods, I am at the plant in the middle of February in Minnesota. And it's warmer inside the plant than it is outside, right? So careful what you wish for when it comes to travel, but do travel so you get to see the world a little bit and get to see the food a little bit. Um, so. Have you ever worked in a Michelin star restaurant? Yeah, French Laundry was three Michelin star. Um, I think Aquavi was two. And uh, yeah, so I have. What perks do you have? What perks do I have? Mm -hmm. uh, I can eat all the salad I want. Does that count? <laughs> Um, how diverse would you say is the culinary field? How do, what was that? How diverse is the culinary field? Um, very. I think culinary is probably the most diverse field I've been into, right? I've worked in a restaurant where I was the only non-black person. Uh, I've worked in a restaurant where I was the only non-white person. Uh, I've worked in a restaurant. I was the only one probably without a criminal records, but you know, it's, it's interesting to put yourself in a situation like that because you understand where people are coming from, right? It's, we, we all think that the way we think is the right way to think where at the end of the day that everybody comes from a different perspective and the more of those perspective you understand, the more that you can empathize with them. If you could give advice to your younger self, what would it be? And then if there's anything you want these students to get from the speaker series, what would it be as well? Um, I don't know. Um, I would say stay in school, um, but I did end up going back to school. So I guess I did listen to myself. Um, I think the takeaway is, you know, love what you do. There are like, you have to recognize that in most parts of the world, you don't get to choose what you do in life. You get told, right? In China, in Taiwan, based on your test score, you can select three professions, like one out of the three professions, and you might not like any of the three. In the United States, you get to do what you want to do. So don't forget that and, you know, do it with love and do it with passion. Otherwise, don't do it. You, could, you can tell when somebody care or don't care. So don't be that person who don't care. Do you guys have any more questions, staff, teachers? Oh, what would you recommend to work on if I want to be a chef? Uh, work on, talk to yourself. My first job was unpaid. I talked my, I was, I walked out of grad school and I went to a local restaurant and asked to work for two, I just asked to work. Like, this is who I am. I want to, I want to be in the industry, you know, like I'll do anything. And I've washed dishes, I've cleaned ashtrays, I've, I've done all that. I've baked, I've made desserts. Um, I used to bake them in the middle of the night just to learn bread. Um, each one of those skills is yours after you master it. So start, start, start collecting skills. Um, it's probably another good way to look at it. Learn how to bake, learn how to make pastry, learn how to serve, learn how to sell. Um, you, those all become things that you'll need in life. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? You can unmute or put it in the chat box. Is there anything else you would like to share with us, Chef K? No, it's a pleasure. I wish that we could do this in person. I have promised Chef Cindy that we break down a hog um, and that that's still on the table. We. Uh, Oh, I, I didn't show you. We actually have uh, Sally over here with a couple of prosciutto and then uh, like four pancettas in there. We broke down a hog here and took one of the old Sally's and commandeered it for a, uh, an aging box. So, you know, chef, I'm, I'm available. Once we get back to normal, you know, I'd be happy to come in. We can get some hog breaking going on and that we can always have uh, charcuteries hanging. Well, thank you so much, Chef K, for coming.